Hi, hi, Jason. How are you? I'm great. Uh, how are you doing? I'm hanging in there. A lot of stuff going on. So I've, I've seen I've seen your profile. I thought to tell uh, about your work to my audience. Sure thing. We can do that. So can you please introduce yourself to my audience? Uh, my name is Jason Fick, uh, spelled F as in Frank, Y-K, uh, kind of an uncommon name. Uh, I am the owner and founder of the Social Media Freedom Foundation. Uh, we are currently working towards fixing the internet censorship problem and the uh, the problem that we have with big techs and, and their kind of like outrageous behavior. Um, we are getting close to solving the problem. We've been at this for years now, um, but we are very close to doing that. And, uh, you know, that that's really what it is. I mean, we're we're trying to basically fix the internet for everybody. Start Adam. Sales and customer facing teams often switch between various communication tools causing time management and visibility issues that slow down deal velocity. The solution is Stat Adam. With Stat Adam, your team can centralize all communications within your chat tool ensuring compliance. No more switching, waiting or fragmented chats. Sales teams reach customers where they are building trust and relationships through constant communication. Plus, Stat Adam auto summarizes conversations in your CRM, eliminating data entry and speed up deals. Join Stat Adam today and start building customer relationships with centralized and compliant chat. So, what can you can you elaborate it? so that uh, we can understand so there is a law and, and this only obviously pertains to the united states right other countries you know deal with it differently but in the united states these companies are given uh what is considered civil liability protection right they're they're given a protection from government to do certain things and the unfortunate part is about 26 years ago when this thing first started the courts read the law wrong right it's called section 230 or formerly known as title 47 u.s code section 230 of the communications decency act that's its full name most people just look at it as section 230 or 230 now what happened was years and years and years ago the courts read it wrong they they just didn't read the words correctly they thought that congress's intent was to protect these companies from absolutely everything well that that's not true that's not right it's not constitutional because they can't have unlimited authority to do anything they want to every anybody else now some of my opponents would argue well they have a first amendment right to take down free speech right well, they do they can take it down but it doesn't mean that they're protected from civil liability they're two totally different things their right to do something and their legal authority to do something are totally different right so We've argued it. Um, I sued Facebook in 2018, and we, we took the case all the way to the Supreme Court, not once, but twice. We are now on our third run to the Supreme Court because the courts don't want to deal with the actual correction of the law. And why I say that is, is that if they fix this, right, if the courts fixed it, they would undo 26 years of bad precedent. Everything else that came before it, almost all of it's wrong. It's a mess. Right. It's almost indecipherable anymore. It's, it's almost impossible to sort it out. And we, we have basically said to them, look, you didn't read it right. You didn't apply it right. And the way they applied it doesn't even make sense. And the reason I say that is because everybody thinks it has to do with these words otherwise objectionable. Right. That they can take down. They can consider anything objectionable. Well, that's not true. It, that actually doesn't even apply. Most people don't realize that. In fact, it's another portion of that law that's wrong. What the thing was, and this is a matter of the English language, right? You know how they say that every word of the law is important? It is. Every single word. Well, it says no, 230C1 says no provider, user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another. Well, the word the there, right? The publisher or speaker is very important because it discerns who the publisher is. We already know that they exist, right? That's what that word means. It's a definite article. So the publisher or speaker is another. So what that sentence means is, is that the service provider, meaning your big tech company, can't be treated as someone else. That's normal English, right? Well, that's not how they read it. They read it as they can't be treated as a publisher, meaning any publisher, even when they are one. Now, all of a sudden, instead of not being able to treat it as somebody else, 
The way they applied it is they said, well, they can't be treated as a publisher in the general sense, which means they can do anything they want, like literally anything they want. That's not right. It doesn't follow the text of the law. And, and everybody says, well, you're trying to get rid of 230. No, we are simply trying to fix it, make it do what it was supposed to do. They shouldn't be treated as somebody else. And they're allowed some, some, only limited protections when they do good faith, good Samaritan things. Well, now, fast forward. A lot of people don't also understand the difference between what private companies do and the state actions, right? They're two totally different things. When the private, you know, big tech acts and the government acts. Well, here's the thing. If big tech censors you, even if government says, hey, can you do this? And they do it themselves. They made the choice. They take your content down, right? In that circumstance, only big tech is acting, right? They're the only ones taking action against you, right? So if you sue that company, can you claim that the uh, the law that's protecting them is unconstitutional? The state hasn't done anything yet, right? Have, has the state acted at all? No. Is there a law that will protect them? Yes, in the future. But see, until you actually sue, then they invoke Section 230. They say, hey, we need state protection. Well, now the state's acting, right? So now the state gets involved. They're no longer just what's called an idle party. They don't, they're not just sitting there. But the thing is, even then, they still haven't violated our constitutional rights. They're just seeing whether or not the law should apply because it is a law, right? So what's called an affirmative defense, but it's not until they actually di- dismiss your case and deny you the ability to sue big tech that your rights can be infringed. All those things have to happen in order to get to the point of the state actually infringing upon your your rights. Now, here's the thing. What does that mean? It means you have to physically lose to even go after the law. It's really, really weird. Like we essentially my rights had to be infringed by the government, right, which they were. I went to the Supreme Court. I tried every single aspect of remedy. I appealed in all the appropriate courts, and yet the court flat denied me. Now they have actually concretely harmed me constitutionally. So the reason that um, I believe that, you know, that you reached out is because I have a post that's going viral because they finally explained it in a way that people understand what's wrong. And the point of it is, is that if we if we're in a situation where the courts won't fix it, right, we can we can talk to them till we're blue in the face and say it's wrong. You're wrong. You can't read it. It doesn't really matter what we say. They don't have to fix it. They don't have any obligation to fix it. They just kept screwing it up, right? Even the Supreme Court, they took on a case to consider Section 230 and then declined to address Section 230. And it's like, well, if you're not ever going to fix it, how are we ever going to get this right, right? So the problem really is the courts. They just wouldn't do it. And then they said, well, we want the legislature to fix it. No, there's nothing to be fixed except for what the courts did wrong. Like the legislation's fine. The law says what it says. Just do what it says. Well, see, here's the thing. Now that they violated my rights, there is a process. It's called a rule, a procedural rule 5.1 constitutional challenge. And what that is, is that when the state has denied me of my rights, meaning past tense, it already happened, right? They've already denied me of my rights. I can then challenge the law that they used to deny me of my rights. I can say, well, wait a sec, wait, no, no, you can't deny me of my ability to sue Facebook because I have a right to do so. And what we've now got them in is, is what's called a catch-22, right? They're stuck. And the reason that they're stuck is because if the court is right, that they can't be treated as a publisher in the general sense, and more specifically that they're saying that the intelligible principle, well, what the hell is that? An intelligible principle sounds nuts, right? Well, it's not. Sure, you're, you're familiar with self-defense, right? Okay. So in self-defense, the basic idea of self-defense is that you, if you do an otherwise unlawful act, like homicide, you shoot somebody, you have to be acting in your own defense or the defense of others, right? Basic. Real basic. That's an intelligible principle. Easily understood principle upon which the, the this affirmative defense is given. Well, guess what? Section 230 has the same thing. And in the case of Section 230, it's specifically it's there it's written it's it's in quotes it says they have to be a good samaritan so the basic premise is is that they have to be acting in in good faith 
for somebody else, not for themselves, right? Like, that's just baseline. Well, the courts said, well, because of the way they screwed up 230C1, they said, well, the intelligible principle doesn't apply to it. And we said, wait a second, wait a second. If they can be a publisher, not be treated as a publisher, they can do anything they want. And you're telling me now that the motive doesn't even matter? There's a problem. Because in that circumstance, if you consider it again in self-defense, that's like saying somebody can shoot somebody else so long as somebody else shot somebody first. And then you can't be treated as a shooter, not not the shooter, not the other guy who shot him. And the fact that they didn't shoot him in self-defense doesn't even matter. Well, that's nuts. That's literally that's just crazy. Because it doesn't make any sense, right? No, they still have to act in good faith as to defend themselves. So what we said was to the court is we said, well, look, if your if your version of this is correct, it's unconstitutional because it's what's called unfettered immunity, right? They can do anything they want, and there's no legislative guidance. You can't do that. Or they're wrong, meaning – we were right all along, and they have to apply it the way it was supposed to be applied and written because then it would be constitutional. So essentially, it's either unconstitutional and wrong or it's just wrong. And the thing is, as I said, courts aren't fixing this. They're just not. It, it's taken us forever to get here because it's just super slow. But we have them in a, in a procedural bind. This is something they have to do. It, it literally in the rule 5.1, it says that the court must certify to the AG that a uh, constitutional question has been raised and that my right to do so is, quote, not forfeitable. Meaning court can't say no. Court can't get rid of me. Court can't dismiss me now. They have to fix this, which means now it gets fixed. And if that happens, which you know, barring the, that you don't come in with the Patriot Act or some crazy nonsense from, you know, Department of Homeland Security to just sort of, or I don't disappear. You get my point, right? Um, we can actually stop them. 230C1 would apply correct because everybody's like, oh, you're going to ruin the Internet. No. 230C1 will mean one thing. They can't be treated as someone else. That's it. It will be that simple. And then... If they take any action at all, meaning they do anything to our content, they get one thing that they can do. They can restrict specifically otherwise objectionable content as the government sees it, not as they see it. It's literally supposed to be what the government um, outlined. And in those circumstances only, if they act as a good Samaritan in good faith, then they get protection. That's it. It fundamentally changes the backbone of the liability protections that these companies have. Now, what impact does that have? Well, that changes the Internet because what happens is all of these decisions that these companies are making to provide you ads, what content you see, all, all of that is content provision, and they will be liable for that. None of that is covered. But see, the thing is, is that – changes big tech because they can know they can only literally provide you the service that's it the service it's on and everybody tries to get like you want a good analogy you know how everybody says it's like a bookstore or a newsstand you know like these big tech companies they're not not at all because a bookstand and a newsstand they consider what content that they provide still right they order it they make money on it right they're for profit well, technically, big tech, if they want the protections of government, they have to act more like a library, a public library, meaning anybody can bring their book in. They can put it on a shelf and then they put the the essentially the locator in the, you know, in those Dewey Decimal System things. And the library only acts as a conduit for somebody to come in, find what they want and go to it. That's it. But let's say that library decides to take your book and put it on the front counter and put a sale sign on it because they make money. Well, now they've decided what to provide to you. That makes them a content provider. And they're, they're trying to make it seem as though the library is allowed to act for its own profit to move the books all around and show them to you how they want and then remove anybody they don't want. That's a content provider. That's not a service provider. That's not a library anymore. That's a, a for-profit organization. It changes the entire dynamic of this because – 
It basically says, no, if you want the protections of the government, you act as a library, and let's see somebody walks in with porn and sticks it in the child book section. Yeah, you can take it out. But if you're taking books out because you're trying to make more money, well, no, now we got a problem. That, that's content provision. That's totally different. And that's, that's essentially what my lawsuit's about is I'm saying that, look, what they're doing is they're wiping out anybody that provides competitive materials, right? Like I had advertising. Well, they sell advertising. Where does that advertising go? It literally displaces us, right? It's in the newsfeed. Normal ads go on the side. They don't compete with normal content. Well, they, they have a whole different business model. They literally remove us for their own financial benefit. And let me ask you a real simple question. If they're acting for their own financial benefit, are they acting as a good Samaritan? They're not, right? Because they're not good Samaritans if they're acting for their own benefit. It's the way it is. So a lot is going to change. Um, like I said, it is if the government can, can, uh, it, I mean, if the courts do the right thing and, and we're, we're hopeful because the judge that is currently involved in this, he's a new judge. I had a ju- my previous judge after five years recused himself. He literally left. So now I have a whole new judge who has nothing to do with this, can read everything as, as one sort of thing and go, yep, you're right, done. We just fixed the internet. It's that simple. So kind of important. So what are your main objectives? What you want things to be changed? I want these companies to be held liable for their own decisions to harm others. That conduct is not protected. The only thing that is protected is if they're specifically acting in good faith to protect others. That's it. If they're acting for their own benefit, and when I say their own benefit, not just financial. Think about the information provision. If they're acting because of their own ideals, oh, I'm only going to show you one side of a political argument, or I'm going to push this forward and that backward. That's content provision. That has nothing to do with what was supposed to be protected by Congress. What is supposed to be protected is, oh, there's child, there's, there's porn in the child section. Let's take that out. That's it. That's just acting good faith. I want them to be held accountable. What will happen is, is guess what? Instead of being newsstands and bookstores that are acting like for profit, they will become a library again. They will provide content based upon what the interests of the individual are, not their own. Changes the game. So, uh, when you started this, and uh, uh, what are you up to? I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean. Uh, when you started uh, working on this, and uh, 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 what? Oh, I, I was. Oh, oh, yeah, I was huge on Facebook. Huge. Um, 2017, I had 16.8 million fans on Facebook. Do you know how many that is? I mean, obviously it's 16.8 million, but in tw- in 2012, that's gigantic. I think BuzzFeed had 9.7 at that time. I was literally larger than they were. And if you think about what that would be today, right? Let's just say Facebook left me alone. I'd have hundreds of millions of fans and the company would be worth billions of dollars. But no. Nope. Facebook decided its business model was going to be to steal our distribution, to sell it to somebody else, and wipe us out under illegitimate, illegal reasons. And meanwhile, they're still ha- they're protected under the government. We're saying, no, they're not protected by government. The government's got it wrong. Like, even their own – it just doesn't even fit the statute. So, you know, what was – I was doing marketing. I was doing huge things back then. I was making crazy money, and, and it was because I got ahead of the system. You know, like the first – what do they say? The early bird gets the worm, right? The first person in. I blew up very, very quickly in social media, and I, you know, I lost a lot because of them. And and they should be held to account for that. They did it deliberately. That was their entire business model was a huge bait and switch. And I think that I mean they know it. If we get past this, it's the end of them. And I mean, I, you know, that's the problem is I think the courts want to protect them. I think that, you know they have money everywhere. Everybody makes money from this situation except for all the little guys, right? So the guys like us, we get slaughtered. You know, they don't like us. Boop, you're gone. No, that's that's not how it's supposed to work, right? You know, um, it's just it's just crazy because you know it, it should be an even fair playing field, and it is not. And they say, well, they can do whatever they want. They have a right to do so. They have a right to do so. It doesn't mean it's legal. 
is that you see the difference, right? Rights and legality are totally different things. You know, um, like it's, for example, let, let's just say discrimination for a moment, right? Let's say somebody says, I hate women. I don't w- want women anywhere near me. Well, that's discrimination, right? But he has a right to say it. The government can't stop him from saying it, correct? Right? It's like, look at all this Palestinian stuff. You have a right to say it. But let's say, for example, an employer says, I hate women. I'm not hiring you. He has a right to say it. The government can't stop him. But it's illegal. It violated the law. Different situation. You see what I'm saying? They're totally different. And everybody's like, well, they have a right to – yes, they have a right to do so, but it doesn't mean it's legal. In most circumstances, if they take down content, it doesn't mean it's illegal. I mean they they would not be held liable for restricting content necessarily unless they did so under an unlawful means. That's what we're saying is the case. If they're doing it for their own financial gain, that's that's an antitrust. It's an, it's an unfair advantage, and the reason being is because they can act as a content provider with the dominant power of a service provider. Not allowed to do that, you know? So what are the things that they need to put in their mind uh, when they are providing this service? What do you mean by what, what things do they need to put the in? The technology companies. Uh, what, the technology what they companies to are going to... If this fixes, what it means is they're not going to be able to choose the content anymore. That's it. They, they are no, because if they choose content, they are the content providers. What they are, they have to go back to is just being, being a conduit for people to go to other people's content. Meaning, if I want to see purple apples, they don't get to say, well, I don't like purple apples. It's no, I get to go see purple apples. And if somebody puts up purple apples, they can't take it down just because it's purple apples. Does that make sense? Like, no, I, I can get to it. Their, their decision is not to see what – their decision is not to choose what I see. Although the courts think they can. No, it's not. That's not protected conduct. What is protected is let's say it's a, a rotten, poisonous apple and could harm somebody. Well, now they could be – they could argue, well, I'm acting in good faith because I just want to protect people from getting a poisonous apple, right? There, there's a – there's a conscious reason that they acted specifically to protect somebody, right? If they could do that, sure, not a problem. You're protected, right? Even if it's loose. But there is no way to argue that if they're acting for their own financial benefit, that they're acting for the benefit of others. There's no possible way to do that. So if what they're doing is because they want to do it, because they want to provide specific topics and not other topics, that's not covered. That's content provision. So they're going to have to change their ways. They're going to have to Go hands off and let people do what they want to do. I would love to see an internet. Now, does it mean that the internet falls apart? No. If, you know, oh, well, then they'll put up porn. No, that's the point. They can take down the stuff that's really bad. That's not a problem. But if they're taking down, you know, um, real information, I mean, look look at this, um, the manifesto, right? I, I don't know if you've seen that in the news. The manifesto for the, the shooter, the trans shooter. How is it misinformation to present three pages in their own handwriting? It's obviously factual. Like, end of story. So why are they taking it down? Because they don't want you to see it. That has nothing to do with it being inappropriate. You know, is it not nice? Yeah, not not nice. Would I say that, okay, they could restrict 13-year-olds and under? Sure, not a problem. But over 13, there's nothing in there that's really that bad. Make sense? There's there's where all those lines start to get a lot more clear as to what they can and cannot do. So how do you define the difference between uh, before Internet and after Internet? What do you mean by before and after the Internet? Before before this change? Yeah. Well, they go from being a for profit bookstore to being a nonprofit library. It goes back to what was supposed to be covered. It It would just change everything because they won't be able to make those content decisions anymore as to what you see they will only be able to make their own decisions as to what is harmful that's it but if they're making their decisions to restrict content in order to advance other content that's still content provision it's just bad stuff that they're allowed to take down and then courts will finally be saying you know the first question will be hey did they act as a good samaritan they've never asked that but that's the first question the second question is when they restricted your content, did they do it in good faith? 
And if they fail either one of those, it's over. You don't get protection. End of story. Go to go. You know. Now they could fail on other claim. You know, they could read statute of limitations. They could fail there. They could failure to uh, state a claim. It could fail there. There's a lot of other reasons. Uh, you know, a case can be dismissed, not Section 230 related, but 230 won't be the protection, the, the unlimited protection they currently have. So at last, what do you say to my audience who are listening and watching this from anywhere on this planet? <laughs> Go to socialmediafreedom.org. Help. Donate. We are going to stop big tech. And and you may not understand everything I just said because it is kind of complicated. But what I can tell you is, is that the little guy, all of the rest of us will have a voice again that all these big corporate entities that control the the flow of information will finally stop like we can stop them again it's socialmediafreedom.org that is what our goal is is purely to restore everybody's voice like yours and mine so that we can compete with the big guys because if a big guy gets challenged where they go boop you're gone you know imagine you know cnn oh this guy's saying bad stuff hey mark zuckerberg can you take him down boom Look at what the government just did. It just came out that the government's literally been doing that. That's a violation of our rights. That's flat out a violation of our rights. And yet they're still doing it. I mean, it's, it's disgusting because, you know, at the end of the day, and I, and I, I don't know which country, are you in the United States or are you outside of the United States? I'm from India. Okay. So if you're in India, you do recognize if the United States and freedom falls here, do you realize what happens in every other country we are the last pillar of hope here and we are fighting tooth and nail some of us to try and maintain freedom because if we don't have it here every country will either become an oligarchy a dictatorship a a, a tyranny it's over for the world so this is incredibly important to everyone literally everyone you know take it for what it whatever you want man this is an important fight uh, I'll put your web link and also uh, about uh, your work uh, uh, in my website. Also, uh, I'll put the web link on the screen and also on the description and the description of this video on YouTube. Uh, people who find our, uh, our conversation can able to see the work that you are doing, can able to think about what you are doing. That would be great. That would be very great. Now, <laughs> I do know there are a lot of tech programmers in India that aren't going to like this because it does change the game. but you know, the the reality is, is that freedom comes before any profit on any company ever. We need to maintain our ability to say what we want. And even if that's on the Internet, these companies shouldn't be able to control all of it. It's just the way it is. But I appreciate you having me on and I appreciate uh, I hope your audience uh, kind of grasps this. This is this is a big change. It's coming. We, we believe we can fix this finally. But definitely if uh, uh, people uh, will listen and uh, will see what uh, what exactly you are saying. If that has a value, definitely a uh, lot of support will come to you. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Well, thank you for having me on. Yeah. And what is your observation about my work? Have you seen videos of mine on YouTube? I have not, to be honest with you. You reached out to me today and you said you want to do an interview. And I said, sure. You know, we we I have um, one post on Twitter going viral because I finally explained it in a way that I think people can understand what's happening. Um but I, I have I, I apologize. I haven't seen any of your work, but it's it's obviously good work because you're reaching out to the right people. Yeah, this is what uh, uh, I, I take interviews of uh, experts uh, from different parts of the world who are into different professions and who are into uh, different subjects and uh, who are uh, solving different problems. Uh, more than 100 countries experts I have interviewed in the last uh, three years and uh, more than 700 interviews I have took. Uh, and uh, have uh, posted on YouTube. So me talking with different kind of people and trying to know about what they are doing, how they are doing, what actually uh, they want to do for the world. Uh, me grasping this knowledge. I, I actually did masters in software engineering, also bachelors in computer science and engineering. Right now I'm doing some DevOps engineering projects. Apart from that, I'm talking with experts like you who are from different uh, time zones and who are from different parts of the world. What I'm going to learn from this and uh, uh, how this is going to be helpful for me in my career. Well, it would definitely let us think about it this way. If you ever design your own social media platform, you know right now you will not compete. 
YouTube, Facebook, Apple, they will smash you, right? Tough. It would level the playing field. They wouldn't be able to do it anymore. So it it changes anybody that wants to invest in any kind of, you know, platform that would compete. If you don't back this, you will never compete because they will own everything, right? That's a very important thing for anybody who is a developer. Anybody that wants to compete with any one of these companies should not want these companies to be able to act anti-competitively and then just be protected from all liability. That's not the way it's supposed to be. So, yeah, very important. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Can I put this video on my YouTube channel with your permission? Absolutely. Also, can I put this video on my social media everywhere, uh, everywhere in the internet with your permission? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much again, uh, Jason, for your time and uh, uh, telling about your work to my audience. Thank you for having me. Take care. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Start Adam. Sales and customer facing teams often switch between various communication tools causing time management and visibility issues that slow down deal velocity. The solution is Start Adam. With Start Adam, your team can centralize all communications within your chat tool ensuring compliance. No more switching, waiting or fragmented chats. Sales teams reach customers where they are building trust and relationships through constant communication. Plus, Start Adam auto summarizes conversations in your CRM, eliminating data entry and speed up deals. Join Start Adam today and start building customer relationships with centralized and compliant chat.